Welcome to the Mamas Have Hit Podcast Birth Story Friday. In this episode, Megan is going to be sharing her two birth stories. Megan had severe preeclampsia at the end of her pregnancy, and at 37 weeks, she was induced. During her induction, though, her baby was no longer tolerating labor, and they opted to have a cesarean birth. While reflecting on her first birth, Megan felt that she was not in control of her birth experience and wanted a different experience for her second birth. During her second pregnancy, she did a lot of different preparation for her birth, and at the end of her pregnancy, she did still develop pre eclampsia, but it was nowhere near as severe, and she did have a VBAC. Welcome to the Mama Safe Fit Podcast. This is Gina, perinatal fitness trainer and birth doula. And this is Roxanne, labor and delivery nurse and student midwife. And this is the Mama Safe Fit Podcast, where we empower you on your prenatal fitness, birth, and postpartum return to fitness journey. Our podcast shares how to move throughout your pregnancy to stay strong and comfortable. Pain is not a requirement of pregnancy. Understand the science of birth and how to approach recovery after birth. We share our personal experiences as mothers navigating the stage of lives, plus our professional expertise as birth workers and fitness professionals. Our goal is to help you feel confident as you navigate the perinatal time frame for an empowering pregnancy, positive birth, and postpartum journey. We are glad to have you with us on this journey and that you've chosen us to support you. Welcome to the Mama Say Fit podcast. In this episode, we have Megan, who's going to be sharing her two birth stories. Her first was a cesarean birth, and her second was a VBAC. And we're really excited to have Megan here because she was one of our virtual doula clients. So we did get to work with her during her second pregnancy. And so we're really excited to see you, Megan. Nice to see you guys, too. It's been a little while. <laughs> it, it has been. It has been. I do like the picture updates of your little one, though. Aw, thanks. So let's dive into your first pregnancy. How were you preparing for birth and how are you navigating your first pregnancy? So my first one, actually, I feel like one of my, I, I don't want to say mistakes, but something that I learned later on was that I did not prepare at all for the most part. I had spoken to some people, you know, that my OB had like a birth class you could take and all of that. And Everyone I spoke to was like, you can take it, but you don't really need to take it. Not, you know, once you get there, they'll tell you everything you need to know. You don't need to prepare for anything. You know, don't don't worry about it. Everything will happen when you get there, which for me was just not the best idea. I had a pretty, pretty routine, pretty uncomplicated pregnancy for the most part. I was very lucky. I, I wouldn't say I had many complications. I was able to work out throughout the whole thing. I felt pretty good besides like normal pregnancy symptoms. Um, I was a little nervous because I will say um, right before that, I had a very early miscarriage. So I was a little cautious in like my first couple months just in case, but really for the most part had a pretty uncomplicated pregnancy until I went in for my 37 week appointment And my blood pressure was like 160 over 110. And they, which is very high for our listeners. Yeah. (laughs) Very high. (laughs) That's pretty high, which I, and I had no symptoms. I felt fine. Honestly, that day I went into my appointment. I drove one car, my husband drove the other. I was fully planning on going into work that day. You know, I had no symptoms. I had no reason to believe that I was going to have a baby in the next week. I just went into it, I drove my car. And I showed it to my appointment and the doctor had the medical assistant take my blood pressure. And she walked out and she was kind of like, I don't know if I heard something right. I want to have someone else come in and take your blood pressure. So she was like, lay down, relax. And so I laid down, I relaxed. <laughs> I was like, okay, well, this must be normal. Another person came in, took my blood pressure. And she also said, you know what? I'm going to get one more person in here to take it. We're just, we're not hearing it right. So a third person came in, she took it. Dr. K, everyone's like, relax, lay down, don't, don't worry. And I'm like, okay. It's a really good way to help somebody relax. Yeah, but, I, but me, I was like, okay, nothing, you know, this just must be something wrong with their stethoscopes. So the doctor comes in right after that and he says, look, these are your blood pressure readings. They're quite high. I'm a physical therapist, so I don't know, like I've been in the medical field. I know what a high blood pressure is. So when they told me, I was like, oh yeah, that's, that's pretty high. So they said, you know what? We're going to send you in. You're going to get an induction. And I had looked into nothing about having an induction. I was really hoping, just not having planned, I just really wasn't hoping to get an induction. I was really hoping for to just go into labor. I think in my head I was going to have a birth like what they show in like the movies where like my water was going to break. I was going to I was going to know it was time to go to the hospital. Like I was going to say I had contractions and like my husband was going to drive me at one point to the hospital. 
But instead, I was going from like a 37-week appointment and dropping my car off at home really quickly and then going into the hospital. And then from there, just kind of everything kind of escalated. When I got there, I was very freaked out because it was my first birth and I hadn't really planned anything. So I got there. They um, took my blood pressure again. It was even higher, probably because partially because I was freaking out and partially because I, <laughs> I had preeclampsia. But they did the blood work and they looked at my blood work and then they pretty much confirmed that I had pretty severe preeclampsia. My blood pressure at that point was led by 175 over 115, something like that. And my liver enzymes looked terrible. They're telling me like my platelets are bad. But at the same time, I also felt nothing. <laughs> so like to me, I'm, I'm, they're putting me in and I'm going, but I'm fine. I'm fine. And they're like, you're not fine. So they started me on the magnesium, which again, like all of this was like just very shocking to me because it just wasn't expected. And I hadn't even read anything really about preeclampsia. I didn't really have any symptoms prior to that. I didn't have any risk factors for the most part. So it was just and the, the week before everything had been fine. It was really like shocking to me when I got there. And then it just kind of cascaded from there. I was put on the magnesium drip, which they, they really warned me could be really terrible. It wasn't terrible. <laughs> I'll say that. But I was really worried. I was literally like crying to the nurse. I was like, I don't want to have it. That sounds horrible. That sounds really uncomfortable. But for me, it wasn't terrible. I was there for three days. They started me on like the typical, like, I'm guessing this is just the typical induction. You know, they, they started with like the pill, like the cervical ripening. Eventually we got to like the balloon and like the Pitocin. Ultimately, I was just I was progressing really slowly, I guess, but it was my first birth and they kept telling me it was really normal for that to be taking a long time. I went in on a Tuesday and they were still inducing me Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. Ultimately, by like Friday, I guess, when they started the Pitocin, everything was like kind of progressing slowly, but they kept telling me it was kind of normal for that to happen. But by the time we got to the Pitocin, they started noticing issues with my daughter's heart rate. Like it was dropping and that was coming back. And every time that they would take me off the Pitocin, her heart rate would go up and then it would inevitably put it back on and hers, they would have a heart rate issue again. Ultimately, they came to me and I ended up with a C-section because I just, it, it kept happening and I was getting nervous. My numbers were looking really pretty terrible from what I was told. And again, Besides like the induction, I, I really didn't feel any of the symptoms of preeclampsia that they kept saying. They'd ask me, you know, are you getting pain fear, any blurry vision, anything in your head? So like for me, it was very hard because I wasn't understanding really what was happening. And on top of that, a lot of what happened during it, I felt very out of control of because I didn't know what to ask. It felt like such a medical emergency and that's how they made it sound. And I'm sure it was. But a lot of things kind of happened where I felt like a lot of things were done to me without really a full explanation. And having not understood, I didn't know what to ask. So anything that they wanted to do, I pretty much kind of went along with. And in the beginning, I would start to ask questions. But towards the end, I kind of lost steam, <laughs> to be honest. I was in the hospital for a really long time. Even like, I, I'd say like the, the point where I felt like I really lost complete control was like, at a point they broke my water. And basically what the doctor said to me is she goes, She's doing like a cervical check and she goes, I'm going to break your water. And she just breaks it. And I just remember being like, I didn't really. It was not informed consent. <laughs> yeah, I was. I, I, you know, I'm sure it was. It was. I'm sure they felt at the time it was necessary. It was just a lot of things that were done. I felt very pushed towards at the time. So I left that birth feeling very out of control. Like I, I felt like I lost control of it. I felt like I lost a lot of autonomy in it. And I feel like I don't blame myself, but I feel like if I had known more, I would have felt a little bit better about it because a I would have known like why they were doing certain things and the severity of what was going on. And I would have also known like what to ask at times, like if I had needed an extra minute here or there, because I felt like a lot of the time decisions were kind of made for me. And then later on, I was I, I would kind of agree to them just because I felt like I had to. So I ended up in the hospital after that for about a week because they couldn't figure out my blood pressure still. So my daughter was very healthy. She was <laughs> she was a great baby. She was she actually they kept saying could leave the hospital, but I couldn't. So it took me like a week to to leave the hospital. I was very lucky with my C-section recovery. I felt like, you know, 
A, because I was in a hospital for a week, so everyone was bringing me food. My daughter was in the nursery a lot. You know, I had a lot of people around me taking care of me. But it, again, it kept being very scary because I kept spiking high blood pressures and the nurses would have to run in and then they'd have to change the medicine. And it took a really long time to figure out the meds before I could go home. And then when I went home, I had a lot of like postpartum anxiety and and depression just from like, I was scared because <laughs> my because of what everything that had happened. I was scared my blood pressure was going to spike. I was scared something bad was going to happen. So I actually ended up, because of that, though, having like a really great team eventually for my next birth. I really loved my cardiologist that I worked with. The poor woman had to see me for like six months after because I was like slowly coming off meds. When I first came in, she was like, these are enough meds for like someone like three times your size. I was on a very high dose of most of my medication. And we kind of had to slowly come off, too, just because my anxiety was so high that anytime someone put a blood pressure cuff on me, I just like my blood pressure skyrocketed. So I came out of that experience just feeling very nervous and like I had, you know, like I, I felt very like I had lost a lot of like autonomy, like I didn't know. So that when I went into my next birth, I knew I had to wait a little while because at least for my doctor and from what I pretty much knew I had to wait. They wanted me to wait at least 18 months between pregnancies if I wanted to attempt a VBAC. And I knew for me, that was something I I really wanted at least a chance at. I knew that like, ultimately, I had to come to like terms with the fact that maybe I would end up with another C-section. But I knew like going into my second pregnancy, I was going to like educate myself enough and like give myself as much of a chance as I could to, to try for that VBAC. Absolutely. And it also sounds like because you didn't experience like the physical symptoms of preeclampsia and the only thing that was telling you that you were sick was someone else doing an exam on you probably also contributed to some of the anxiety where you're like, well, how am I going to know if something's wrong if I'm not experiencing symptoms? Like I can see that being like really anxiety producing as well. And when you can't really trust your blood pressure, because I mean, I couldn't even trust my readings sometimes because I was so nervous about my readings that inevitably my readings would be high sometimes. And they'd have to like almost like talk me down as I was as I was doing it. And that's really hard. Our like emotional state is like a really big impact on our blood pressure. And at first, like you didn't think anything of it, but your blood pressure was really high. And then the more you learned about it, it's way harder to get that blood pressure taken without having any anxiety. Like some people would be like, oh, just calm down. It's fine. And you're like, no, it's not. <laughs> but so it's not like the least helpful response thing that someone can say to you yeah. when you're, just calm when down. you're nervous. Just it's just relax. <laughs> it's not a big yeah. deal. Like it is a big deal, actually. So let's get into your second pregnancy. So how did you prepare differently this time? And what were some things you did the same to prepare for your next birth? So with my second one, I pretty much, I don't want to say I was a preeclampsia expert, but I looked up everything I could about preeclampsia, about preventing it. I also, though, like in my head said to myself, as much as I can prepare for it, I also have to understand in my own head that I didn't do anything because in my head, I also thought I caused it. Like I was like, if I had done something different, this wouldn't have happened. And I had to kind of come to terms with the fact that it was not necessarily something that I caused. Uh, I didn't do something to get it. It just happened to happen to me. But with my second birth, I, I had researched about taking aspirin and my doctors did start me on aspirin beforehand. I had looked into, I mean, I've always worked out. It's It keeps me sane in general. I knew like I was going to keep working out through this one. I had reached out to Luckily, I like I had my cardiologist who I really like. I really like her and she was great and she was very understanding. And she, this is kind of like her area is working with women with preeclampsia is like one of her specialties, I think. So I went to her very early and saw her regularly throughout my pregnancy. And then I reached out to you guys because I had done your workout program my my first pregnancy. But then I saw you guys were doing I don't know when you started doing like virtual doula appointments or, or like taking on doula clients. But I saw you had that. And I had kind of spoken to a few doulas in the area that would be like in person, but a lot, you know, didn't have the experience or it was like incredibly expensive or just, you know, it just didn't work out with with them. They were going to be too far away. 
So I knew I wanted to have a doula. And so I reached out to you guys knowing that you did the virtual, like virtual clients. So I made sure that that I set that up and you guys were really good about like every month we were meeting and like talking through like anything that I felt like I needed or anything I needed to discuss about it. I also I think I did a lot of things. I also did. Um, I looked up like all these because I knew like if preeclampsia came out early, I wanted to also be as ready as possible. So I was doing like the dates. I was doing the tea. I don't know. I, I know you guys had mentioned at the time that like dates were actually scientifically proven, but I, I know the tea they say may not, but I was going to give it a, a go anyway. Give it I a go. I don't think it hurts. Yeah. It doesn't hurt. <laughs> it doesn't help. We don't know, but it doesn't hurt you. So I like tea. So I just use that as my tea. Oh, what is it called now? I forget. Raspberry leaf. Yes. Red raspberry leaf tea. <laughs> I did that. I had a chiropractor. I just, I knew also that this was going to be my last birth. We were only going to have two kids. So I really wanted to try my best to make this as close to what I wanted it to be as possible or to give myself the best chance. So I did all these things. I knew that my doctor was not necessarily, they were VBAC tolerant, like from my experience. And it really depended on the doctor that I saw what they would say. And I knew once I went to the hospital, it was going to be, it was going to depend on who I got. And so I would have to be prepared to like advocate for myself a little bit because the doctor that I saw regularly in my office was, she was very supportive. Both of them. There are two in my office that were very supportive, but there were doctors. And this happened to me with, with my last birth, the doctor who delivered my daughter, I had never met her. She was the one who was at the end with like the C-section and, and breaking my water. And I just, I, I think a lot of that went into it, too, where I just didn't I hadn't known the doctor that delivered my my daughter. So this time around, I kind of knew that could be the situation, but I didn't have any doctors in the area that I that I knew to to go to or that would be able to take my insurance. And I just kind of wanted to stick with what I knew. At least I knew the practice and it was very close by. So at least I knew what to expect with them. So as much as I would have loved to have had a, a practice that I felt like was more supportive. I felt at least like by having a doctor who was supportive and that knew from the beginning this was something I was interested in that I felt okay with that. That was kind of my prep for for this one. So let's get into your birth then. How was the end of your pregnancy? I'm very lucky to have very like, I wouldn't say, I don't want to say comfortable pregnancies, but like I, I don't have a, many major issues, you know. Towards the end, they were saying my son was breached, but he did turn a couple weeks after they told me he was breached. And, you know, I'd gone multiple times to my chiropractor just to, like, try to make sure. Oh, actually, I didn't even go in for the appointment this time. So they had me checking my blood pressure at home. I was taking the aspirin. And from about 20 weeks on, they had me checking my blood pressure at home. Just a normal day. I, I took it every morning. I took it on Monday morning. It was a little high. It was like 140 over 100. I know I can get nervous, so kind of like, you know, tried to relax. I'm home with the kids on Mondays. My husband's at work. I texted him. I said, you know, my blood pressure's a little high. So they said, so he said, okay, we'll take it again when I get home. You know, that's our pretty typical. Sometimes I get myself worked up, and if he takes it, it inevitably is a little bit better. So he came home later. He took it. It was about the same. So I called my OB. They said, come into the office. Um, we want to check it. We don't see a reason to freak out. If anything, we'll put you on some medication. This was at, I should say, this is at 35 weeks. So this was a little early. My daughter was born at 38 weeks. So this was a little earlier than that, which in my head, I was also kind of disappointed because I had kind of read a little bit that it usually moves back. But this one moved forward a little bit. Well, you might have had elevated blood pressures earlier in that pregnancy as well. Or I guess you had the appointment right before, so maybe not. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, well, what I will say with this one, it didn't get as severe the second time. But it also, I caught it, I mean, I had taken it Sunday morning and it was normal and Monday morning it was high. So I pretty much caught it like that day. <laughs> yeah. So I went in that afternoon. They, I mean, I went in that night actually. It was pretty late. Probably like their last appointment. And the woman, I got there and I, I waited quite a while. She took my blood pressure and she said, look, it's high. We're going to send you in for, for blood work because that's really the only way they can tell. Because last time I, I didn't only have the preeclampsia. I pretty much had like help syndrome. My blood work was kind of a bit of a mess when I got there. <laughs> so this time around, they sent me in. I kind of knew the deal. When I got there, my blood pressure was high because I was freaking out too. 
So it was probably even higher than it would have been. But this time around, I got there. They did the blood work. They took my blood pressure. Basically, I had while I was there, I had three very elevated blood pressures, which was a combination of my blood pressure actually being high, probably, and me also freaking out. So they told me they were going to start me on um, some medication and they were going to put me on a magnesium drip for 24 hours. I never ended up leaving the hospital. <laughs> um, Spoiler alert. <laughs> Spoiler alert. So they started me on that. They got back the blood work. I can see the blood work when I'm in. So I have like an app on my phone from the hospital. I don't mean for this to be, but you can see it as they go. My blood work was OK. So they came into the room and the woman who originally triaged me was like, we're going to put you on a magnesium drip. We're going to give you blood pressure meds and we're going to keep an eye on your blood pressure for the next 24 hours. Once you're on the magnesium, we have to keep you here for a certain amount of time. But if everything's fine, we probably will just send you home. So the next person that comes, so they bring me in, um, they put me in a room, I'm on the magnesium, they've given me medication and my blood pressure is looking good now. But a doctor walks into the room. Again, it's my practice. They, it's a doctor I haven't met. And she goes, okay, we're going to schedule you for your C-section in a couple hours. And I go, wait, what? <laughs> because this was not my understanding. I looked at my blood work. I said, you know, it's not bad. She said, well, your platelets are a little low. I said, my platelets are higher than they were at my, like, last appointment with my with the doctor. No one sent me into a hospital. Like, she said, well, you had elevated blood pressures this many times. I said, look, I'm not ready for this. I promised myself I was going to give myself a little bit of time as long as it was not a medical emergency to, like, think things through. So I asked her for more time. Again, this was like late at night. I'm sure they just wanted to like figure out what was going to be what they were going to do. They knew I was 35 weeks. I was at zero, but I had my cervix was was soft. So it was like tricky. I didn't know even that they could do an induction at zero. Like I just kind of figured like, oh, this stinks. Like maybe if I push it and I have a little bit of time, maybe I'll progress on my own. But then another doctor, a resident said, because I was fully ready to be like, I'm just going to stay in this hospital for 24 hours, see what happens. Like, this isn't an emergency. So another resident that was there with her said something like, well, we could try a balloon because I know they can't ripen at that point. So they can't start an induction. Like I had looked into like inductions, what they could do, what they couldn't do. I was really hoping to not have an induction, but, you know, it kind of I knew that there was a chance. So I knew they couldn't do a cervical ripening again. So I had to hope that they could like start with the balloon. So she said, we could give it a go. And my doctor was like, let's go outside and talk. (laughs) I don't think she loved that someone else said something. So I'm sitting in there waiting and she keeps coming in. She keeps mentioning that she wants to do a C-section, that if I if I don't do a C-section, I'm going to have to fill out all this paperwork that I'm fully aware. And I just at that time, I got very lucky that I also I think we probably called you guys at that point. It's kind of a blur. But I had a very... We talked a bunch. Yeah. (laughs) And my husband probably called. (laughs) But I know my nurse was also very nice about it, too. She was very... I had a nurse that was very good. Not that my nurses the first time around weren't, but this one really, like, I felt like she was really... I felt like she was really pushing for me to, like, kind of, like, have some say in what was going on. And she said, she was like, look, I can't tell you what to do. She's like, but one of the residents is saying that they try an induction being that you've, you know, last time I did progress, it wasn't that I didn't progress. I got to like six or seven centimeters and then my daughter's heart rate was having an issue. They said, you know, you have a better chance because you've, you have progressed before and your cervix might kind of know what to do. So after like a, I, what felt like forever, but I think was probably just like till midnight, they agreed that if they could get the balloon placed, that they would attempt an induction. I had to fill out the paperwork basically saying like, I understand that I'm going against medical advice, which felt really scary. But I said, as long as I could like see, like they were saying, my son, my son, I didn't, we ended up knowing accidentally <laughs> what my, what I was having. Um, my son's, as long as he was looking good and as long as my blood pressure was staying where it was and they were giving me the medication to keep it there, I was comfortable going forward. So we did that. They were able to place it. And then once it was placed, they said, okay, well, we'll take you up to labor and delivery because we're doing an induction now. So we went through the induction. <laughs> And I got pretty lucky that everything kept going. My blood work continued to look okay. My blood pressures continued to look okay. So this one was definitely a milder, I don't know if it was a milder case or we caught it earlier, but it did not get to the point that my last one did, which last time my platelets were super low. My liver enzymes were really bad. So like even like blood work wise, when I looked at it, like it was pretty bad. This one never got there. My platelets did drop. 
So I had like a plan in my head, like I didn't want to go for an induction, but I knew like as I went through, like I was going to have to have an epidural eventually. Like I I wanted to stay away from it as long as I could because I just wanted to be able to walk around and do things. I wasn't uncomfortable. I ended up getting my epidural because my, my platelets did start to drop. And they basically said to me, like, you're a TOLOC. And if you need to go in for an emergency C-section at any point, if your platelets are too low and we can't place an epidural, you're going to be put under general anesthesia. So for me, that was like, I knew my decision from there was going to be, I was going to get an epidural just because I didn't want the chance that I had to go under general. So I progressed in there. They had, the balloon came out before I even got like the epidural. They started on Pitocin. I had two very nice doctors, much, I felt like this time, one of them was like my favorite doctor from the practice who I had met with a bunch and I was so relieved. My nurse that like I had that first day, she came back everything was like going really well. Like this is, this is great. And I'm progressing. She was doing a lot of work with like the peanut ball and stuff, which again, like the first time no one ever did anything with that with me. Like I didn't know anything. So, and we were like, we were communicating constantly. I was just like asking random things. My husband was like, he's always been super supportive. So like he was like on the phone with you guys, I think texting constantly. I was probably popping in every so often just out of it because I was on a magnesium. Just to say hi. <laughs> yeah, just to feel like I'm still here. And like the magnesium at that point was kind of hitting me, like just being in labor was hitting me. And like, I was really excited that we were progressing and progressing and progressing. And at like a point, so this was Monday night into Tuesday, I had my favorite, <laughs> my favorite doctor, my favorite nurse, and I was progressing so well. And then I was at like nine and a half. And I stayed at nine and a half for so long, it felt like I was so uncomfortable. I had like so much pain in like the back of my hip. I just had like, I guess, I don't know if it's back labor, but I definitely had a lot of pain in my back. But, and of course, what happens is my my favorite doctor goes, okay, I wish I could be here for this, but I have to go now. <laughs> and who is the next doctor who comes on? Oh, of course. The doctor from the first day. <laughs> that had told me that she was going to have to give me a C-section. And to make it even worse, she didn't even come in the room. The new nurse came in and says to me, oh, I heard you and the doctor had a real problem at the beginning or whatever she said, something along the lines of, I heard you and the doctor had a real issue. And I was like, I wouldn't call it an issue. I would call it, you know, a difference of opinion. <laughs> I said I wanted to try, you know. I was like, I don't blame her. And I didn't really. I knew what she was. I knew she was doing what she thought was best. But so that was extremely, I think I texted you guys like, it's going to be the doctor that that was from the first She's going to wheel me back, guys. She, <laughs> and she was much stricter. She definitely turned down my Pitocin. Like I was like having trouble feeling contractions from because so like she had a very strict like protocol and the Pitocin would not turn it up. She had the midwife do a lot of it, which actually honestly probably worked out well for me because it was a little bit less of an awkward situation. My nurse was super helpful. I was having real trouble feeling contractions. So they were helping me knowing when to push. She was doing like a tug of war with the sheet. You guys were giving me advice on like feeling like where I should push from. And I did, I will say I got towards the end. I forgot to, I forgot to press the button when you're supposed to like get pain relief. I forgot to. And then towards the end, I was like really uncomfortable. And they were like, did you press the button? I was like, nope, not at all for the last like couple of hours. So I'm, I'm like, <laughs> which might have been fine. <laughs> anyway, yeah, it actually it was it was OK until like the very end. And then he did finally like make his way out after I think I pushed for almost three hours. It's a long time. I was exhausted. I should I should say they did not let me eat from the time I was brought in on Monday night. I was on no food with like a like a towel I could put like in my mouth to like to, like a wet towel that I was allowed to like suck on but not swallow. <laughs> Magnesium. Yeah. And then I was finally when I was finally progressing, they would let me have an all liquid diet. So I was starving. <laughs> I was exhausted. And I had to push for like three hours. And I really thought I was so scared because they had also broken my water. I was so scared because in my head, I thought I only had 12 hours after that. So I was like, I have to get this baby out. They told me later it was not actually that immediate. <laughs> but they were like, you it was didn't, not that emergent. Yeah, they were like, you didn't need to, you know. <laughs> they were like, if we had seen something wrong, we probably would have. <laughs> but I don't know. In my head, I had made up a number that I that I was allowed to go to. So I ultimately ended up, when he came out, I was so relieved. And I actually reached down to grab him. And they were like, no, 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 you can't take him yet because he was wrapped around the umbilical cord was <laughs> had wrapped around his neck. And they were like, we have to untangle him. And I just I wanted to just grab him. I don't know. That was like my natural inclination. Oh, I will say that, like, it did feel good. And it almost 
I hate to say it felt a little better because it was that doctor that had told me the first day that like I wasn't going to be allowed to. Yeah, I shouldn't have been like that, but it, it did feel a little bit like. <laughs> no, but you proved you proved them wrong. Yeah, I feel like I got I got very lucky with my team. Like I had you guys there. I had some nurses who were extremely supportive. I got to have my favorite doctor for a little while. And my husband was just he knew like what I wanted. And I felt like I had really advocated for myself. And I like knew what like ideally what I have loved to have just, you know, had had gone into to labor naturally and been able to have my son at like, you know, somewhere between 37 and 40 weeks. But I didn't. But I was able to kind of navigate through what I could have, like I, what was available to me with what was going on. So that made me feel really good. Yeah, and it sounds like it made a huge difference too, as opposed to feeling like things are being done to you without like really any conversation on like your options versus the second birth where you were more educated on what was available to you. You had more people in on your medical team that were advocating for you and offering you options that you may not have gotten like previously, I think makes a huge difference in a lot of people's births to feel like you have the decision making authority, that you get to be an active participant in your experience, regardless of what path your birth took. Like, I'm stoked that you had a VBAC and I know that that was a goal of yours, but I think you would have still had a positive experience if you had a C-section as well, because you were just so much more informed this time to be able to make the decision like, yeah, now is a really good time to have a C-section. Like, I think that's the best course of action. But at the beginning of your birth was not the time. You were like, that's not what we need to do right now. Right now, what we need to do is try to have this baby vaginally. Yeah. And if that changes, I'll let you know. Like, I'm, I'm here to be consulted about that. And I think that's that's awesome that you felt that you had the power and that you knew that you had the power to be able to advocate for yourself. And I think made a huge difference in your birth experience. So how is postpartum this time for you? Much better. I mean, I will say it's funny. My my daughter was like, I don't know if you, she just knew to be like a an easy baby because I had had like such a, ro- a rough time. <laughs> An angel. But she was like, she like slept through the, the night at like three months. She was, she ate anything that I gave her. I love my son, but he is a toughie. He like, he's still a pretty good sleeper. But like, I was at like three months. I'm like, why aren't you sleeping through the night? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, your sister did. And he's, yes. he like was more particular with his bottles. Like I had to change the bottles that I used. Like he, <laughs> but for me, I feel like even after my C-section, I was up and moving. I felt oh, like pretty good even after having a C-section. Like, you know, like people will say it's rougher. I wouldn't say mine was especially rough. This one, it was more like unexpected rough because I hadn't had a vaginal birth before. Like last time, like was where like the, the dis- and I hadn't ever pushed last time. Last time I, you know, where the surgical scars were, that was uncomfortable and like sitting up was uncomfortable that time. This time, just some of the the things that came up that were like uncomfortable. And I, I wouldn't say I had a very complicated vaginal birth, but there was just like some some recovery things. It was definitely I could get around a little bit easier. Like there were different discomforts, but this one there was definitely discomforts that I wasn't it's still uncomfortable. Yeah. Imagine birth is still, yeah. is still uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, and like, I like I feel like I got hit by a bus every time. Yeah. <laughs> well, even my abdominals, just from like pushing for three hours, I felt like I had done the hardest abdominal workout I had ever done. Yeah. And I like working out. I was so surprised how my, I just felt like I was beat up, honestly. <laughs> but postpartum, like I, I wouldn't say, last time I definitely had the bad anxiety and the, the depression. I would say I still had a touch of it, but not to the degree, not to the degree I had it last time. And I knew, again, like the resources to go to. I knew my psychologist that I had gone to last time. I knew like this time I didn't need the medication, but last time I did go on a medication for because it was it was pretty bad. My anxiety was really high last time, but I knew if I needed it, I knew what to get um, and I knew who to reach out to. Yeah. So that helped a lot during this time. So like just mood wise, I still felt a little bit down, but nowhere to the point that I did last time. And I I immediately was like reaching out to resources that I had had the last time. That's awesome. Do you have any advice for someone who's at the end of their pregnancy? And I feel like everyone just suddenly, if they get preeclampsia, it's just very sudden, like if there's no buildup, it's just like, and you have it. 
Do you have any advice for somebody who's at the end of their pregnancy and maybe like suddenly found out that they had preeclampsia or they have risk factors for it or maybe a prior birth they had it? Like what, what tips do you have for them? I needed the team. Honestly, I, I just needed to feel like I had people there who like I could trust to be honest with me because that was a hard part when I, I felt like I didn't trust that one doctor. So like just having a team that like you can trust and you feel like you can go to and like you feel like they're going to be honest with you and give you the options. And then the other thing is if you have the option, like I feel like I was rushed into a lot of decisions. If you have some time, just taking a couple of like a few minutes just asking if like I think they'll tell you the doctors will tell you if like, no, this needs to be made now because when my daughter was born, ultimately, when we decided on the C-section, they were like, you need to decide now because this is going to be emergent. But like, I think that like something that was huge for me was just being able to like take a second this time and like talk through my options and to find to like understand what was emergent and what was something that like maybe we could wait a little bit and see. And then it's just also like, it's not your fault. <laughs> yes. That was, I feel like to me, that was like the roughest thing. I was like, I worked out. I did this. Why didn't I know? And there's just, I know they'll give you like things you can do. And I will say that I think I did everything they asked me to do. And I still got it a second time. Like I, I had none of the risk factors. I had nothing, but it was like, and coming out of it, I felt like if I could have just done this, if I just ate better this day, if I just worked out a little bit more, but it, it wasn't. It was something completely out of my control in a lot of ways. So I think that was what, that's what I would say. Well, thank you so much, Megan, for one, trusting us to support you during your pregnancy. It was definitely awesome to work with you throughout your pregnancy, to support you at your birth virtually and be a part of your postpartum experience as well, because we, we still text you. <laughs> um, and thank you so much for coming onto the podcast and sharing your birth story. So yeah, thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you for having me. <laughs> Hi there, my name is Carly. I'm a huge fan of Mom and Stay Fit. I've taken a handful of their courses. I would highly recommend their childbirth education course to anyone who is expecting, along with any support people that will be there with you during your pregnancy and labor and delivery. My husband and I took the course together, and not only did we learn the science of birth, the biomechanics of the pelvis, different labor positions and comfort measures and techniques, we were presented with unbiased information so that we can make evidence-based decisions that were the best for us during our pregnancy and labor and delivery delivery. We had to completely pivot from our original birth plan and I believe that I still had such an empowering, incredible experience in part due to the wonderful information that was provided in the childbirth education course. Thanks Gina and Roxanne. So in Megan's birth story, she shares about her two experiences with preeclampsia. In her first pregnancy, she had severe preeclampsia, and this is defined as having either a blood pressure that is 160 over 110 or a blood pressure that is 140 over 90, along with other symptoms. This could either be elevated labs or it could be symptoms such as a headache or blurry vision or a right upper quadrant pain that's like constant, doesn't really go away even epigastric pain. Any of these other symptoms can be a sign that your organ function is being affected by your elevated blood pressure and likely moving towards delivery is recommended. Since Megan didn't have any of the other symptoms, but her blood pressure was 160 over 110 and higher than that as her like time progressed in the hospital, this is very alarming and sometimes can even lead to a stroke. So moving towards delivery with even just a blood pressure, even though she had no symptoms, is recommended for her and baby. So Megan's second experience with preeclampsia, because it was not severe, where she had elevated blood pressures above 160 over 110, and she didn't have her function of her organs being affected, it was reasonable that she could have that induction of labor and she didn't need to be delivered imminently by an emergency C-section. She had that option and she had the time, because it wasn't severe, to be able to make decisions for herself and be more involved with her care versus somebody telling her what she needed to do. So during Megan's second pregnancy, she educated herself a lot more on preeclampsia and the signs and symptoms of it and better understood what a severe preeclampsia looked like versus a non-severe preeclampsia. And so she was able to determine in that moment, hey, like I have some time to make a decision 
Like, can I have some time to think about this a little more? And it helped her feel a lot more empowered in her experience. Not that she was against the C-section if that's what she needed at the time, but she felt really good about being able to take the time to really work through different avenues. And she felt like she was able to make decisions throughout her entire birth experience. So just to review, the signs and symptoms of preeclampsia are a elevated blood pressure that's at least above 140 over 90, a headache that does not go away with pain medication such as Tylenol, right upper quadrant pain, blurry vision. So this is a change in your vision where it was clear and now it is blurry, and then epigastric pain. When you go into your doctors and you do have that elevated blood pressure, they'll normally do some blood work on you as well as look at your urine to see about your protein in your urine. And these labs will give a better picture of if your organ function is being affected by your preeclampsia and maybe moving towards delivery is recommended. If you have any signs and symptoms, it's recommended to call your provider and have a conversation with them on the next course of action or even go in into your provider and let them know that you're having these symptoms associated with preeclampsia. Preeclampsia is one of the leading causes of maternal death, and so it is really important that you do have it treated. Thank you for listening to Megan's birth story. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to like and subscribe to our channel so you get notified whenever we release new episodes. We release new episodes every Wednesday and new birth stories every Friday. If you're pregnant and you're wanting more support throughout your pregnancy, you can join our online prenatal fitness programs and our childbirth education course. If you're postpartum, you can join our postpartum fitness programs to help you return to fitness after birth. And then we also have our postpartum education courses that now include postnatal yoga, infant massage, and infant CPR. If you're a professional or you're wanting to learn more from us, you can join our birth worker course and our fitness trainer course where you can earn CEUs and learn from my expertise. And as a thank you for listening to this entire episode, you can use code STORY10 to get 10% off any of our online courses.